Welcome to the Upland Nation podcast. I'm Scott Linden, your host. Glad you could join me. Hope you enjoy the broadcast and uh, maybe learn something here or there and at least have a little bit of fun. That's my goal today, especially. You know, over the years, uh, I've gotten thousands of questions, uh, most of them sincere, and I try to be sincere in my answers. Sometimes I'm right, sometimes I'm not, but we'll talk more about that in a few minutes. I'm going to answer a lot of those questions, but um, with tongue planted firmly in cheek. So uh, roll up your sleeves so your funny bones are exposed. Coming to you from the Cabela's podcast studio, in addition to the questions I get, our Handle It segment on how hand signals can confuse your dog as often as they help him. And in our This Land is Your Land public access segment, we'll talk a little bit about oh, kind of the unsung spots in the Southwest that might be of use to you as you ponder your snowbird future this winter. Our reader poll this week, uh, how's the season going? And uh, finally, uh, some hunting reports from all of you. So Keep it right here on the Upland Nation podcast and um, appreciate your time, appreciate your attention. Well, over the weekend, I uh, made my annual pilgrimage to um, an old wagon road that comes up out of a trout stream that I love and visit frequently in the summertime. That wagon road, once I figured out what it was from way down there, about waist deep in the water, has been uh, kind of a gateway, if you will, to a bunch of um, interesting adventures over the years usually not many birds up there at the top and uh over the course of the weekend uh about five thousand feet in elevation gain total chuckers yes uh sometimes valley quail and uh once in a while you just never know i've popped a couple mountain quail up there in the high desert as well so always worth one or two visits uh the first day was with a good friend of mine and his young dog so we enjoyed that part a lot. Uh, it was cold when we started and just right when we finished. And then the next day, all on my own, a solo trip up that wagon road and back down. And it did not disappoint in um, in many ways. Didn't see a whole lot of birds. Didn't even pull the trigger, but sure enjoyed the heck out of the whole thing. And there's some history there. So um, maybe someday it'll become a magazine article. In the meanwhile, um, you had a much better weekend if I, uh, if I can uh, deduce anything from your Monday morning debriefs on the Wing Shooting USA Facebook page. Celia Rausch and her wire hair, which could be a cousin to my wire hair flick, uh, they were in the snow somewhere, but um, that's okay when you got eight valley quail laying next to your dog. Congratulations, Celia and your dog. Christine Schwartz couldn't find the birds, but she tried hard. My good friend David Gilbertson took my advice and went to the club and practiced his shooting. Okay, maybe I should have gone there instead. He says, now the dog should be happier. I'm sure that dog is always happy. Um, thanks. Good to hear from you, David. Travis Hampton, congratulations. Your first chucker. Looks like pretty rough country up there, so I'm glad you got a little bit of a reward for it. Your dog as well. And then Eric Loacker, I think I'm pronouncing that right. Loacker, he said it was a special weekend. My first bird dog and my first bird. Welcome to the fraternity, Eric, and um, glad you got off on the right foot, if you will. And um, lots more of that coming every week on Monday morning. Just check in with the Wing Shooting USA Facebook page and uh, let me know how you did. I'm going to start sharing more of my trips as well there. And uh, that's my promise to you over the next few weeks and then maybe some oldies but goodies from earlier in the season as well. All right, the Upland Nation podcast is brought to you in part by the Dog Energy Bar. Go to dogenergybar.com. It's uh, busy in that department over here in the shop. Fill in orders for all sorts of people. It's kind of the thing that, um, you know, you can go to your coffee or your um, candy bar. Um, this is a healthful version of that for your dog. Instant energy, healthful food-grade products uh, imported from Denmark, where the Danish 
sled dog team for their army uses it when they're patrolling Greenland. It must work. Learn more about how it works and why it works. Take a good long list of the ingredients at dogenergybar.com. All right, so um, if you follow the TV show, you follow my Facebook page or anything else, you know that I get a ton of questions. And and this morning I answered one for a a guy who is disturbingly like me in that he started his bird dog and bird hunting career at about age 30. So, you know, in the vernacular of today, if you're a millennial, you want, you know, it's like a feather in your cap to see you're an adult onset hunter. Well, you know, whether you are or not, I couldn't care less, but uh, this is a great question or two from this guy, and he just lives over the hill about three three hours away, so I, I gave him a bunch of advice, but it reminded me that there are thousands of questions that I've gotten over the years, some in the book, and then some I answer on Facebook, some I answer in other ways, and then now I'm going to answer a few here. Now, uh, the difference being... Um, Usually I try to be helpful. This time I'm going to try and have a little fun with it. So if you asked one of these or it sounds like one that you might have asked, uh, but maybe a little bit different, well, don't forget the names have been changed to protect the innocent. And all of my answers are all in good fun. So if you can't take a joke, Turn off the podcast right now, but if you can and you have a lot of, uh, and you know, you know, you have a lot of sympathy for these questions and these question askers, well, thank you. And those of you who asked the questions originally, thank you for being the Dean Martin to my Jerry Lewis. Don't we all need a few more laughs? Well, here's my attempt. I hope you enjoy it. And oh, if if you got kids listening, don't worry, it's family friendly. But you kids, don't try any of this at home. And don't let your parents try it either. All right. The first question. Scott, for someone who's starting out with his first hunting dog, what can I expect to go wrong? And that's signed, Clue Liss. Well, I don't know that I got enough battery power in this recording device to uh, tell you all the things that might uh, go wrong. That would be a couple of days long of a podcast. But if you'd like to learn more, go purchase my new 1,438-page book on the topic. Here's some advice from Chapter 367. Minor adjustments to your lifestyle, I'll call it. First, invest in a GPS collar. It's a good insurance policy should your spouse decide to leave you, as she'll be much easier to find. Also, Practice sleeping on the couch. Don't worry about other hobbies, non-hunting friends and relatives, as the laws of physics and the space-time continuum will eliminate any free time you had before you got that puppy. And from chapter 762, same book, Economizing with Your New Dog. Buy your paper towels by the truckload. But forgo expensive chew toys, your wife's heirloom, Louis XIV armoire will probably suffice. Don't forget to graduate veterinary school. And remember that dog food is an expensive luxury as long as you leave the door to the walk-in pantry wide open. Good luck, Clue. Or is it Mr. Liss? All right, on to the next question. What is the best method to convince your children not to undo undo your dog's training? Signed, Big Miss Take. Well, the first thing I do is build an outside kennel, Big. Can I call you a Big for short? All right. Build the outside kennel and then supply plenty of fresh water and bring them in periodically to socialize. Now, it might get cold and wet out there, but they'll get used to it. And the whining and the yelping should cease fairly quickly. In the long run, you'll have fewer behavioral problems this way. Oh, once in a while, take your dog out there to visit them as well. Thanks for your question, Big. 
Okay, I know, I know. Some of these are better than others, but uh, hopefully one of them will turn into a story for you. Okay, how do you get your dog to stop taking off with the bird after he retrieves it? That's the question from Lay Z. Lay says, it's like a chasing game. They drop it, you go to grab it, they grab it, then run away again. How do you stop this? Well, I try a 30-foot check cord. Clip one end to the dog's collar and the other end to your truck. Cat Louver. Louver? Cat lover? Yeah, okay, there. Asks, do you ever hunt without a dog? And I ask, why? My children want to help with dog training, but they're not very disciplined themselves. They have dirty rooms. They lose their homework. They have bad man manners. Terry Boldad says he wants some help with that. Well, Terry, I would try an electronic training collar. They're nowhere near as inhumane as they used to be and speed up the learning process when used correctly. Vibration and tone give you a lot of flexibility when it comes to behavioral change. Start with a low stimulation level and work up as necessary. Oh yeah, take the collars off before you drop them at school. Here's another one. Here's the question, help. My dog won't come to me when called. Signed, starting out. Starting out? Yeah, okay. Well, he doesn't come when I call him either. Try making it sound like a filet mignon and see what happens. This question, um, I get this one a lot, actually. Um, how long does it take to train a dog? Thanks. E z way out well easy a year should be sufficient for me to tell you how long it will take to train a dog here's one maybe you've heard this before my dog is in a constant state of shedding both in the house and the truck can i do anything about it signed harry holmes well, Harry, despite the claims by some folks who own one of those doodle-type dogs or short hair breeders, all dogs shed. A good diet and regular grooming will help, but the real solution is to own the furniture, carpets, and truck upholstery that match the color of your dog. I know that's easier said than done. So if your dog is ticked, spotted, checked, or striped by two homes and two trucks... I get this one a lot as well. How can I get to go hunting with you? Thanks. From Nita Friend. Well, Nita, I'm always looking for guest hosts on the TV show, especially if they shoot well, and then let me take the credit. Just send me a detailed letter with all your qualifications going all the way back to graduation from high school. Now, write it within the margins of as many $50 bills as you need to draft a convincing proposal. I'll look forward to getting your long letter. All right. Uh, yes, it goes on and on, but soon enough, you'll get yourself a break. In fact, that'll be in just a moment or two. Here's one more before the break, though. What do you think of a Labradoodle for hunting? Signed, are you kidding? Exactly. And maybe you do too, now that I think about it. All right. We got lots more coming up, including our public access segment, a handle it segment on your dog and the things I've learned the hard way, all coming up in just a moment. So stay with me.
Not that he had any need for it, but uh, Flick ran another 55 miles over the weekend. He is an incredible animal, and he is in the best shape, well, of any dog I've met so far this season. Uh, one of the reasons he is is because of Dr. Tim's performance dog food. I feed him the momentum formulation. It's about 35% protein and about 25% fat. Seems to suit him well. It agrees with him. He likes it, and it delivers the goods. This guy is doing about 25 miles every day. I let him out of the truck for a hunt. The reason is the quality ingredients in Dr. Tim's dog food. And before I forget, let me remind you, 30% off your first order. Just use the code UPLANDNATION. And take a good long look at drtims.com, D-R-T-I-M-S.com. Find a formulation that you think will work for you. He's got everything from old dog stuff to the performance dog stuff like we're using at our house. And uh, the ingredients are um, all laid out right there. You know exactly where every protein source came from, every vitamin, every probiotic. He tells you exactly where everything is from. And so um, when it comes to transparency, well, he's as transparent as they get. It's all at drtims.com. Go learn a little bit more about how dog food, sh dog food should be made the right way. Dr. Tim's. Dot com. And yes, I wear my ESP electronic earplugs in the field. In fact, I was way up on top of a really bare hill, a bare meaning there were no birds up there. Two or three times over the weekend, I could hear the rafters down in the canyon. Yeah, 3,000 feet below me chatting it up down there well they're kind of obnoxious to begin with but that's you know just my opinion i guess but anyway i could hear them as well as i could hear anything else including flicks collar tags and uh the wind and uh, yeah the chuckers fleeing in the distance the two or three times we actually got close enough to to figure out that's what it was learn more about esp electronic earplugs at ESPamerica.com. ESP stands for Electronic Shooters Protection, and they do the job. 30-day money-back trial. Get fitted locally in the comfort of your local audiologist's office. Just go to the website, ESPamerica.com. Go to the dealer locator page and type in your address, ESPamerica.com. Yeah, every day in every way, I learn something from my dog, Flick. Hopefully, once in a blue moon, he learns something from me as well. But I was reminded again of how important hand signals are, especially when your dog is at 600 yards and you want him to get him to come back from the other side of that canyon. You cannot yell that loud. You certainly can't even blow a whistle that loud. <laughs> you know what I had happen? This hasn't happened for a while, but I blew that whistle so hard the little pee inside got shoved into the little slot where the air comes out. It wouldn't trill anymore. I had to whack it against a rock. Plenty of rocks up there. Anyway, um, instead, hand signals, arm signals, whatever you use, uh, kind of the, those kind of things seem to work well, but you got to be a little bit more careful. I was directing Flick to um, a spot where I, I wanted him to kind of poke around in a little bit of the greenery that the one of the few places with greenery down there and he was confused and he, you know a couple times went the wrong direction i finally realized it's because i'm holding my shotgun in my right hand and i'm gesturing with my left hand he can't tell the difference you know at two three four five hundred yards he doesn't know which is an arm and which is a gun so i had to put the gun down kind of sort of behind my back and gesture with the one hand i wanted to use so Check yourself on that sort of thing. If you have to, put your hand in your pocket, put it behind your back. Be careful about shotguns, of course, safety first and all that. But remember that a hand signal is supposed to clarify a direction, not confuse your dog. So um, be careful about how you're doing that. Uh, and maybe you won't have to learn the hard way like I did.
Welcome back to the Upland Nation podcast. I'm Scott Linden, your host. Uh, trying to answer some of the questions that I get, you know, in the course of a year, whether it's on that survey at the um, uh, National Shooting Sports Foundation website or Facebook or whatever, and trying to have a little fun and loosen things up. You know, people get a little bit too uptight once in a while about this kind of stuff. So I've taken all of these questions I'm getting and finding some that are kind of fun. If you asked one, don't take it personally. And uh, if you haven't figured it out by now, all of these questions are being asked by fictitious individuals, uh, pseudonyms, nom de plume. And here's one that uh, I can relate to. I have a two-year-old German short-haired pointer, and she won't come when I call her unless I put the e-collar on. Then she listens just fine. That's from Will Trainer. Well, professionals call that collar-wise, Will, and it's very common. When training, keep the collar on most of the day and go back to basic yard work. Start with low stimulation, increase it as you need to to ensure compliance. Now, once you've mastered the basic recall in the yard, introduce distractions and other locations. And then when you've got that figured out, go ahead and put the collar on the dog instead. All right. I've often wondered, he says, does all the shooting during a bird hunt affect the dog's hearing? Signed, what you're saying. Well, I can't tell. So I went to Flick for this one. And uh, he says, huh? Yeah, so seriously, don't shoot over your dog. Get around him. Shoot with your muzzle ahead of the dog. There's my one serious answer. <laughs> if you could purchase only one item to help someone training a hunting dog, what would it be? Says Chip Skate. Well, Chip, if I had to narrow it down, it would probably be something liquid from the Islay region of Scotland. The older, the better. What is the best dog for pheasant hunting? Thanks from I will mooch a lot. Well, I think my answer will not surprise you. The best dog for pheasant hunting is someone else's. You know, since I did that show on them a while back, I've been getting this question periodically, too. What is the difference between an American Brittany and a French Brittany? Sincerely, Ron, every time. Well, Ron, the Epignol Breton, which is translated as uh, misspent college fund, is smaller and has more variety in coat collar and a nimbler hunting style. They're also a little bit snootier. All right, what is the best dog for a slow old man, asks Buster Keister. My answer, a slow old dog. How do you get a year old lab to understand what you want him to do? Sometimes he just doesn't get it. Regards, Meta mistake well i'd wait until he's a four-year lab be patient what is the best all-around breed for hunting everything asks i am lazy is that i am lazy or maybe it's lazy well i am that would be a 140 pound labrador i've hunted with them all over south dakota and they excel at that kind of that deep cover, standing corn. They're natural retrievers. They hunt well in the uplands if you keep them within gun range. They love water. They're great family dogs. And if you're really tired at the end of that last hunt, you can ride him bareback all the way to the truck. Here's one I haven't seen for a while. My wife allowed me to get a golden doodle and said I could train it for hunting. She told me to ask you for any recommendations. Signed, I fell for it. Well, I, you might ask your wife for permission to buy a 
hunting dog. That's my recommendation. Is it better to use two dogs at a time while hunting? Thanks. High cost of fun. Yeah, most of the time it is a good idea unless they're my two dogs. Scott, have you trained any of your dogs to find mushrooms? Signed, Hal Lucinate. No, I'm still refining their skills of finding skunks, cow, poise, cow pies, barbed wire, porcupines, rattlesnakes, oh, and, and dead fish along the river I was telling you about earlier in the podcast. I'm Scott Linden. You're listening to the Upland Nation podcast. And um, we're just, yeah, the good news is we're just about done with all these questions, but just a few left and we've also got of course our this land is your your land segment so stick around for that as well okay what's the best way to feed a dog pieces of wild game asks ham burger well i'd say accompany it with an amusing cabernet of course and remember to cook it rare or it will be fishy and it may offend your dog's pal oh oh Oh, wait a minute. No, I, I think you meant in the field. All right. Usually a dog instinctively knows how to remove the back, the heads, the wings, and the innards and deliver what's left to you. So just shoot the birds close with a full choke and he'll serve himself buffet style. When does a dog really enter his prime? Thanks, Noah Dia. Well, it's been my experience, Noah. Dogs enter their prime about the time my knees give out. My golden retriever loves pheasant and quail hunting, but she doesn't hold a point longer than 10 seconds. Should she be trained to hold a point longer? Thanks, Ron Sport. Well, Ron, your golden is a retriever. That said... 10 seconds is better than most of the Shih Tzus, Cocker Spaniels, Pugs, Pit Bulls, and Basset Hounds, and most of my wire hairs. How do I teach my three-year-old chocolate lab to stop chasing a pheasant in the air after I miss it? Please don't tell me to learn to shoot better. No, I wouldn't bother with that because... I want to see that dog chase a pheasant in the air. And finally, how do you tell your buddy his dog sucks? Thanks. From I Am Lying. Roger, you can't fool me with that alias. You're now off my Christmas card list, and I'm never bringing you to any of my secret spots again. Boy. The nerve of some of these people, I tell you. What am I going to do? Anyway, thank you. If you have a serious question or just one for fun, talk to me on the Facebook page or take the questionnaire at the NSSF website. All right, coming up is This Land is Your Land. We're going to talk about some snowbird destinations, but first, Gunner.com. Yeah, they've gone beyond Gunner kennels. They're now Gunner everything from fans and tie-down straps to T-shirts and hats, nameplates, all-weather kits. They've got a little bit of everything for you when it comes to taking care of your dog, including that new feed bin, which is, well, it's bomb-proof. Let's just put it that way. Learn more about all the products now available at Gunner.com. Financing, free delivery. Try the vehicle fit guide. Learn more about them at Gunner.com. Trying to help you have a good time in the outdoors by at least steering you in the right direction. This land is your land is my take at that. And everybody knows about the two hotbeds for winter quail in Arizona, Sonoida, and Patagonia. But how about some of the outtakes? Head north to Tombstone. 
Scaled and Gamble's Quail and a fun visit to an authentic Western town and movie set. And don't panic, those are phony gunfights. If you care to join in, bring plenty of blank ammunition. Oh, the good news about the tombstone area, the ground is more level than Sonoida or Patagonia and the habitat is more desert-like. You're out that way at all, looking for another place, check out the Tonto Basin. It's a desert stretch near Roosevelt Lake. Most of it's public land in the Tonto National Forest. You know, this might be the first chance I get in a long time to get back into that country. So um, if you live down there, watch out. I may see you in January. Fair warning. And if you got some suggestions on where to go, no, I don't mean like that, uh, where to go hunting, uh, feel free to share them with all of us via the Facebook page or my findbirdhuntingspots.com website. Quick reminder, the Upland Nation podcast is brought to you by ESPamerica.com. Protect your hearing, wear them in the field, wear them at the range, and... Um, then next year, you can just turn the volume down on my next attempt at trying to be funny on a podcast. Mercifully, thankfully, couldn't come too soon for most of you. We've come to the conclusion of this week's Upland Nation podcast. I hope you got a chuckle here or a guffaw there. Hope you learned something in our serious segments. If any of that was true, please tell your friends. If not, please tell me. If you want to talk in between now and next week's podcast, go to the Wing Shooting USA or the Upland Nation Facebook pages. Sure would appreciate a review on Apple Podcasts. That's, uh, that's the one that really counts. So thank you in advance. I'll leave you with this quote from George Bird Evans. He says, dogs, being such wonderfully uncomplicated beings, they need us to do their worrying. Glad to do it for you, Flick. Thank you all for listening. I'm Scott Linden. Have a great week. <laughs>